Uh, okay. Yeah, so for those of you, I see quite a, uh, a lot of new names. Those, those of you that don't know me, um, my name's Kim Knowles. I'm based in the Department of Theatre, Film and Television Studies and uh, Aberystwyth University. And um, I'm co-director with Miranda Wall of the Centre for Material Thinking. Uh, so thanks for joining us. This is the second iteration um, of a collaborative research seminar, seminar format that um, we developed uh, last month, I think it was. And um, the centre, just to give you a little bit of background to the centre, we launched it uh, last November. And the, the main intention, we've just been having quite an interesting discussion with uh, tonight's participants about what material thinking actually is and how we can define it. So it, with the, the intention was to stimulate interdisciplinary dialogue um, around the question of, of materiality. And I think we're coming from this, coming at this from the premise that, um, as Karen Barad argues, the very stuff of the world is a matter of politics. Um, and I was thinking today that Rosie Bradotti's um, writing is, is very relevant in terms of thinking about material thinking. She says embodied, she talks about the embodied and embedded material structure of what we call thinking. So we're interested in both materials, but also in thinking, the process of thinking. Um, not just the thinking about materials or thinking uh, with materials, but thinking through materials and using materials as a way to think about thinking. Um, and um, as we were just discussing before everyone joined us, actually that opens up um, quite an interesting space of ambiguity, um, because I think probably um, most people are doing some kind of material thinking in their work, but don't really um, think about it consciously. It isn't something that they think that they're doing um, to be materially thinking or thinking about materials, but obviously materials come to play in that, um, in that process. And so the idea with these um, sessions is that we gather academics um, and um, creative researchers within Aberystwyth University um, as, a, as a starting point, which we then hope to open outwards um, and to ask those people to contribute some thoughts about what material thinking means to them and for that not to be a kind of polished, finished uh, intervention, but, it, but for it to actually provoke um, some kind of dialogue, for it to open up more thinking about thinking materially. Um, just to note also that um, we intend for these presentations as well as the recordings, um, we intend for these presentations to be um, uh, presented on the website. So we have a, a website in development. Um, we received some funding from the university to um, develop that website, get some support to do that. And um, that will be in process over the next month. And um, we hope to come up with some interesting ways of, of presenting um, these interventions through images, sound, video, text, and uh, a combination of those. So this is, this is the second one. As I said, the third one is on the 4th of May and um, involves uh, an equally eclectic uh, mixture of, of academics. So tonight we have, um, we start with um, Mike Brooks, who's a um, creative research fellow in uh, theatre, film and television studies. And then we move on to Milia Koki, who's a professor in the international politics department. Then Meredith Hopwood, who's a professor, professor in Welsh and uh, Celtic studies. Joe Ironside, senior lecturer in uh, IBUS, the Institute of Biological, Rural and Environmental Sciences. And um, then Gareth Hoskins, a senior lecturer in the Department of Geography and Earth Sciences. So what we, um, how we're going to run this is that each participant uh, speaks for about eight to 10 minutes. And, um, and then if you have any comments or questions, you can of course 
put those in the chat, but we'll save the the questions um, to the to the participants until the end, so we can gather those up um, and um, bring them into into the dialogue. As I said, I'll finish the recording before we get to that stage. So you can either um, just have your question there and I'll read it out, or you can unmute yourself, put your camera on um, and ask it directly. So um, let's uh, let's get started. So um, Mike Brooks, I'm going to hand over to you and your thoughts on material thinking. Should I start the video? Uh, yeah, I'll just start the video if that's okay. It's fine. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the work that artist Rosa Casado and I have been developing and how those developments have become increasingly tied to direct engagements with the stuff and material of things and places um, that we found ourselves working with in aspects of the most recent phases of our ongoing now 20 year collaboration together. Our work has always paid particular attention to performance as a place and social space and to the situations that emerge from the actions and material practices carried out in our execution of the acts and events that result from it. Um, and this approach has increasingly implied considerations of the work as situation, as emerging through the collective presence, behaviours and interactions of its constituents, understanding collective as an ecology of multiple natures and needs. So for us, these projects are the constellation of things, behaviours, material and immaterial relationships, scales and temporalities that emerge and become possible or apparent during their performance. And again, understanding performance in this sense as a space to make and an act of embodying the social, as a socio-spatial configuration where relationships and exchanges can be activated, rehearsed and explored. Working in this way, from understandings of performance as place uh, and of the social as rooted in the establishment of interrelations, has led us to develop a number of proposals overtly configured through the activation of connections and through the act and performance of that connectivity in itself. And in this connecting, we've often tried to highlight the provisional groups of agents that participate and together manifest the given work, um, as well as the perhaps fragile and contested nature of their interdependencies. We've been thinking for some time about how here and now are never just here and now, but are always connected to many other places and to many other times. And about how, as the things that we do and the ways that we conceive the world, increasingly blur the boundaries between different scales of place, the sense of where we are and of what is happening here also expands in that it becomes increasingly apparent that what happens in one place is also always part of what happens elsewhere. This is what Rosa and I have often talked about as performing an expanded sense of place. And from there, questions arise about who and what is and is not here and now. Opening a space for connections with what we do not know, with what we do not see, with those agents and things not apparent, and inviting us to consider where we are and who we are in an actively expanding way. Perhaps approaching an engagement of place as the ever-evolving process of our general and inexorable and problematic condition of being together, as Massey put it. The projects that we are currently working on, um, that we have most recently begun to group together under the intentionally simplistic working title of Piles and Holes to highlight their material roots and bias, very much continue these explorations. 
but attend, above all, to things and situations in which materials from distant and disparate geographies are gathered, are piled together, and the corresponding sites and processes of extraction that enable those gatherings. These objects and sites of accumulation are often geophysically improbable places where out of place materials, fluids, residues are combined, piled up, producing naturally improbable compounds and environments where broader landscapes of material displacement and interconnectedness become apparent and non-human entities become entangled with human processes and infrastructures that expand beyond human control. In our latest large scale performance project, which we called The Sky Was Clearer in Those Days, for example, which this video is a brief extract of the raw footage from, we dismantle and break down a used family car over a week of public performance episodes into its separate parts and materials, pulling apart and spreading out its steel and aluminium and copper, its rubber and fabrics and glass, its plastic and foams as we go, as a way to reflect on the scale and reach of human activity of which the car and its production is part, within wider considerations of the atmosphere as the primary shared and connecting medium of our living together, where the residual dusts and traces of our actions accumulate and are distributed, connecting distant places and extending the limits and effective reach of what we do spatially and temporally. And in another and our most recent project, an evolving gallery work that we called Divine Matter, we focus on a single European colonial period religious painting, a striking depiction of Christian Saint Agatha, referencing the story of her torture and martyrdom, painting produced in Naples around 1650, and began with a meticulous reconstruction of the painting with a particular focus on the natural material pigments that it brings together through an attempt to, to produce as faithful a copy of both the appearance and material construction of the original as possible, allowing us to explore and consider the painting not only as a physical trace of the context it was made in, but also as a physical combination of fragments of the material world it was made from. Unpicking the material, temporal, geographical and social interconnections it embodies as an object, the, the painting begins to appear as a strangely geophysically unlikely place in which pulverized rocks from the mountains of Afghanistan and the ground bodies of insects from the tropical and subtropical regions of the Americas combined with plant extracts from Mediterranean pines. Material uses and combinations which inevitably begin to articulate the extractions, commodifications and trade routes resulting from European colonial expansions of the period. But importantly, not proposing a reading of these materials as a geological trace record of past practices and hierarchies, but as an attempt to touch and operate within the complexities of the geophysical and social landscapes that these materials and objects are still a part of. At its simplest, through these projects and through these overtly physical material encounters, we are perhaps looking for ways to open recognisable yet uneasy and naturally messy spaces that emerge from their circumstantial juxtapositions, from accidental separations, from paradoxical configurations, and that might invite multiple behaviours and understandings and initiate situations and processes in which multiplicity, complexity and contradictions are revealed rather than resolved or simplified. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Um... Yeah, as I said in the introduction, if anyone has any um, comments or questions, do feel free to put them in the chat and uh, I'll come back to them um, at the end. 
when everyone's presented and we'll bring everything together then. Um, so we move on now to Emilio Cookie, uh, who, as I said, is a um, professor in international politics. Over to you, Emilio. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, fascinating <laughs> question, fascinating topic, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for um, inviting me uh, along to this. Can I just check? Can you hear me okay? Um, super. Um, right, uh, let, me, let me first apologize by saying I'm a little bit rambly potentially today. Um, because I'm a little bit tired. Uh, I have a conference going on and panels are all in the middle of the night and it just means that I haven't slept a great deal <laughs> recently and it doesn't particularly help uh, uh, this lack of sleep. This for, doesn't help us today I think thinking about this topic because it's really fascinating but it's also at least I find kind of mind-blowing uh, on, on, on many levels and uh, as a result, I feel quite confused and discombobulated, how do you say, uh, today, trying to think about material thinking. Um, but thank you for inviting me along. Um, and I'll, what I'll try to do is just, I'll make some remarks. I'm not sure they're very coherent, uh, but hopefully they'll give you a sense of the kinds of things I've been thinking about that have something to do, I think, with material thinking. Uh, what that exactly is, I don't quite know, but maybe there's something in there uh, that will be useful. Uh, for somebody uh, or for Kim Miranda uh, 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 as you develop the project. Um, let me just start by saying something about my uh, background. So uh, I'm based in uh, International Politics Department. Uh, I'm what you might call a, a, a theorist, an international relations theorist or political theorist. Uh, and what I'm in particular interested in uh, are basically the ways in which our uh, ways of conceptualizing the world <laughs> uh, structure the ways in which we do politics. And I'm in particular uh, interested in the ways in which our conceptions of politics are actually kind of embedded in long term uh, historical, cultural background traditions uh, about how we put the cosmos together. So in a sense, I'm interested in cosmology and I'm interested in the political effects of particular kinds of background cosmological assumptions uh, that we work with uh, as we come uh, uh, to the world. And in particular, I suppose I'm interested in the questions of kind of climate, environment, and how also uh, our cosmological belief, belief systems, uh, at least certain cosmological belief systems, are tied up with the reproduction uh, of, of environmental harms. And the project that I'm actually currently developing uh, is uh, a project around uh, what you might call uh, planetary democracy or planetary politics. Uh, so basically, I'm exploring the um, uh, the the problem, in a sense, uh, of uh, anthropocentric conceptions of politics. I'm interested in uh, exploring with a variety of different other people who are working in this uh, field at the moment, the idea of uh, expanding our notions of political uh, beyond the human. So instead of just assuming the culturally specific uh, kind of Western uh, uh, assumption that politics involves just the humans uh, in the human uh, rooms, uh, whether it's at the UN uh, doing international politics or whether it's in Downing Street doing national politics, uh, that there's something fundamentally like a miss about missing the reality of the actual planetary relations that we're in, if we do politics uh, just like that. Um, and it's also important in particular because that uh, particular conception of political negotiation with others is also so culturally specific. So it is not universal. It might seem to some of us as universal. To me, it often seems sometimes universal. There's only way, in, this is only one way in which we can think about politics on the planet. But of course, that's not all, at all the case. It comes from uh, somewhere. Uh, and, and what I'm interested in doing is kind of exploring the different ways in which one actually develops uh, what Rafi Yuat calls uh, 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 interspecies politics or multi-species uh, uh, politics, um, and then how that might actually tie up to how we come back to the questions of climate change, uh, uh, but also actually uh, of democracy <laughs> and debates around kind of how to reinvigorate uh, 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 democratic systems, which are not really working for, for the people in them uh, and also for the wider ecological relations in which those people uh, uh, people live. So I suppose at the moment, the research question I'm working on is something like, how do we deal with the kind of, um, the conceptual kind of difficulties that we have when we come to thinking about our politics and in particular, how do we get at these kind of actual communities that we live in, the kind of multi-species communities that we actually live in, uh, rather than the kind of abstract notions of community, the nation, 
you know, as a community uh, or the international as, as a community. Uh, these notions are kind of quite abstract, but also they have particular sets of kind of uh, what I call lifting operations uh, are embedded uh, uh, into them. So in a sense, to think about the nature of the state, for example, uh, it already involves a kind of a, a lifting of us into an abstract space of, of, of interaction uh, in this notion of the state. Uh, the international is a similar kind, of, similar kind of notion. So how to kind of think beyond those the international, the state, these abstract notions to actually start to think about the real, real physical communities in a sense that we are interested in is how I come to uh, be interested in the questions, I think, of material uh, thinking. Um, I'll be very lucky to be working to be working with Kim uh, uh, for the last couple of months on a project on uh, visualizing planetary politics. And one of the things that we're trying to actually do at the moment is exactly think about like, how do we break apart the idea of that the world is kind of out out there on a map, <laughs> uh, how do we break down the idea of the planet as this kind of uh, beautified sphere object kind of sits out there uh, instead of being kind of with us in the relations that we're actually uh, in. So how to kind of reconfigure in a sense the visual imageries through which we come to think about uh, think about politics. And it's a very interesting question, partly because, I mean, one of the things that we've been, we've been exploring um, is, um, Precisely the fact that actually to think about politics differently, to think about international politics differently, is in part about breaking the visual imagery altogether. <laughs> the idea that we can visualize uh, the planet, that we can visualize uh, the globe uh, and everything uh, on it. And how do we do this? Well, in part, the idea has been uh, through actually exploring non optic. <laughs> non-visual ways of kind of being in the world as ways of uh, premising different ways of doing politics. So not, you know, instead of me giving you a map, uh, here's the world, the world of the international or the beautified, beautiful kind of picture of the globe, uh, 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 which we see all around us when we look at media and so on. The idea is in a sense to break down, how do we actually start from our senses in a sense, other than visual senses, to get at uh, thinking about what might be actually political kind of communities, political communities uh, in a sense uh, 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 around us. And so what does this have to do with materiality? Uh, I don't quite know. So this is where I get also very confused, but I'll just make a couple of notes really quickly. How am I doing for time, by the way? Sorry, in my, my rambly state. Yeah, you have. How many minutes have you have I got? Another couple of minutes, yeah. Super. So how does this link to uh, uh, materiality? Well, on some level, I don't really know, but I think what we're interested in uh, exploring are those kinds of things that also many others uh, are interested in exploring. Um, this idea of kind of being in the world, uh, being kind of effectively uh, uh, back in the relations that we actually exist within uh, within in the world, rather than in a sense doing what we often do in my field of international politics, which is that we somehow kind of, we uproot ourselves off the planet, look down upon the map of it as a kind of a whole. And we, as a result, we're always kind of hovering somewhere above the planet, <laughs> looking down on the political problems uh, of the planet. So whether we're looking at the problems in Afghanistan from up high, <laughs> or whether we're looking at them, you know, the problems in Ukraine from up high, or whether we try to theorize the nature of international community, we're kind of looking down uh, uh, in a sense on to the relations of the planet rather than actually rooting ourselves uh, uh, into it. And so this has been the kind of the question uh, that I think somehow is wrapped up fundamentally uh, with this materiality uh, question. But the materiality is also weird because I think there's something material about kind of not trying to think from the outside. <laughs> but then also I'm getting really confused here because then I don't even know what materiality is. So there's a little part of me as a good old um, 
watermelon. <laughs> Sorry, there's this lovely book called Strangers, which Kim, which, which Kim um, recommended I read. And there's this lovely metaphor of, uh, uh, of watermelon. Uh, those people that are kind of green uh, on the outside, but also have like red socialist policies, politics on the inside. And I think I'm one of those <laughs> kind kinds of watermelons. Um, uh, Sorry, where was I? Now, for a good old watermelon Marxist uh, that comes from those kinds of traditions, um, what's really interesting about materialism, of course, is that materiality and material thinking uh, in the kind of Marxist vein uh, is about kind of root, rooting our abstract understandings of the world uh, into kind of a sense of the reality of materiality. But then the new materialist literature, which I'm actually much, much more interested in, and I know Kim and others are also, precisely kind of takes away this idea that we can root anything in material. Because, of course, the material isn't material <laughs> because we have, in a sense, been trying to also break down the idea that there's something like ideas and then matter, a kind of a, 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 a material thing. <laughs> there isn't anything thingified to root ourselves into in these kind of new materialist ways of, of thinking. So that's partly why I'm, in a sense, I suppose, uncomfortable almost with the idea of root, um, of at least any kind of rooting in materiality, um, because it has also has the danger of kind of reproducing the division between kind of us somehow as and things and material things out there. So I don't really know what to call. I, I, my, I suppose as, as much as I have a conclusion so far, it's something like, yes, I'm super interested in material thinking, I think, um, but I'm also somehow trying to not think about it as material thinking, um, I think. Uh, but simply, I think, because of the watermelon watermelon legacies uh, perhaps that I have of kind of having a, a fear that a kind of old kind of materialism uh, and old kind of materialist thinking actually might travel back into our thinking uh, by calling things material thinking. Okay, I'm super confusing. I'm confused. I, I hope I haven't caused confused you too much, but I'll stop confusing anymore and I'll just, uh, I'll shut up. Um, <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And don't ever be uh, apologetic for confusing, because I think, you know, sometimes we need to be in a state of confusion in order to, to think about things. Um, and, you know, what I wanted to say is that, it, it, you know, there's something really generative about ambiguity and those spaces of not knowing. It's when we think that we know everything about the world that the problems arise, right? So, you know, it, it, it's for me really useful to go back to that state of um, of not knowing and that that sense of in-betweenness and, and saying to ourselves, okay, you know, what is this thing? How do we how do we interrogate it? So from that perspective and for those reasons, I think that, that your uh, intervention, your provocation is is precisely what we need. So thank you so much and I, I really hope that we can um, loop back to, to some of these ideas and, and some of the questions that you raised in the discussion at the end. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, Meres Hopwood uh, is, um, is gonna join us next. Uh, Meres is a professor in the Department of Welsh and um, Celtic Studies. Hello, Shumai. Diolch, Amelia, I'm gonna try to to share, I don't know if this is going to work. Slideshow from start. Can you see that? Yes. Yeah, and and thanks, Amelia. Um, I'm going to add to to that uh, sense of ambiguity. I'm I'm quite sure. Um, yeah, it is. It is an intriguing subject, and I was intrigued when I listened to the first round of this uh, material thinking. I I processed the words in my bilingual head, of course, material, the principle, the essential, the relevant, the fabric, the fabric, which gives me Danith, Devnith, which takes me to Parry Williams, after whom I shared home on Penglais's name, and to his poem, <laughs> that's it, to his poem, Moilni, the talks of his very material self being one with the mountains after his passing 
Devonith. For as Humboldt said, words resonate on the instrument of the soul. They make connections. They take you places. Devonith took me here. And then thinking, opinion, reflection, which gives me medal, which is both thought and cognition, but also in Welsh, mind and intellect and imagination. Imagination. Now that's interesting, and we'll come back to that. And then there was Kim's introduction to the series. Thinking about everything, Kim, I don't know if you remember. Materiality in all its manifestations, materials, objects, things, stuff, matter, whatever you want to call it, she said. So I suppose that as a writer, my material, therefore, was this. And that's a posh example, a silver gift, pretentiously and lovingly, since it was gifted by my college friends, used for best. A more practical, well, I shan't say honest example of my material tools, might be a pencil or a biro or a ballpoint pen. And then that would take me to my stock answer for when people ask me, what's your favourite word? And while in Wales, at least, the list of favourite words generally includes Bendy Geddig, Pendra Munagal and Achavi, on some days, for the flavour of words differs from day to day after all, I offer Kugelschreiber, German for Bayro, and listen to those vowels, Kugelschreiber, and stop to think. Kugel, sphere, globe, like the world, Schreiber, writer, a scene at the end of this macaronic poem I wrote once, one who writes the world. Which brings me to what my material really is, words, and beyond words, language, and, and I have no idea if that counts for this. I mean, it's not exactly a thing. Indeed, nobody knows for sure what it is. What is language? But then I reflected, there was more to Kim's introduction. She said this, how materials, human and non-human, animate and inanimate, come to bear on our attitudes and behaviours. Importantly, how the fragile ecology of things and the way that we think about things has an impact on the future of the planet. And we'll definitely come back to that. And then her next clause warned us not to think about things as pre-constituted, fixed, or inherently noble. It was then that I thought perhaps I might have something to say on this curious matter after all. For here we are in a bilingual community that through its very bilingualism challenges any and all notions of fixed knowledge. For unlike the monolingual mindset, the bi and my multilingual mind, as we here understand tonight, knows full well about how knowledge is constituted depending on the window through which you look at it. And like the monolingual mindset uh, that seems to think that having another language is simply a case of having two sets of labels for the same set of things, our multilingual context teaches us that it's not, not at all. Different languages offer us different ways of perceiving, perhaps even constituting the world around us. Well, let's start with words. This, in English, is gorse. In Welsh, ethin. And who cannot hear how ethin must concentrate the mind on the soft velvet gold petals, while gorse sees the prickly leaves. And I'm not going to pass judgment on which is the wisest perspective, but it is different. And then there are things like Cymru and Wales, two labels for the same things. Well, Wales comes from the Anglo-Germanic Welsh, meaning essentially the other. Clearly, not an able one gives oneself. Cymru, on the other hand, from com and brogos, com together, brogos, a piece of land, possibly margo on the margins. Cymru in Welsh then is thought of as the together land. I love that, embracing, inclusive, whoever's here sharing this piece of land is Cymru. And then beyond the words, there are the constructions. Think of the way we constitute, let's say, possession when we speak Welsh, in a materially different way from when we speak English. In Welsh, I can't say 
I have a Porsche. I have to add, every time I use this example, I can't say that in any language without lying. What we say in Welsh is, there is something with me, not subject, I, with a capital letter to boot, verb, have, object, silver pen, car, but rather there is a biro with me, a construction that is, shall we say, much more aware of the transient relationship between us and things. They're just with us for now. And it's not just Welsh and English. Think Spanish. In Spanish, you can't say when I will come to see you. It's always a case of when I might come to see you. Cuando venga. A humble acknowledgement somehow that things might hinder my visit. The bus might turn up, might not turn up. I might even catch COVID. And back to King's Kim's introduction. She talked about relationships between people and things. That I would like to suggest is hugely influenced by the language we use to think about it. And perhaps this is something that our group here in Aber, as members of a bilingual community, multilingual, could explore further in this material thinking thing, the way language influences the relationship between the thoughts and the stuff. We perceive materials, we might say, through five senses, sight, hearing, touch, smell, taste. These refer to our ability to interact with things in the here and now, externally. But what of the three internal senses or faculties? Memory, understanding, imagination, those vehicles we use to perceive the material world beyond the here and now. A vehicle that enables us to perceive the material world beyond the here and now. Is that not language? Elephant, breath, sound, word. And there you have it, conjured in your mind, a thinking about elephant. Well, my time is almost up. What then of that suggestion Kim put forth about how the way we think about things has an impact on the future of the planet, or oh, there's wisdom in words. Did you know that Welsh had a verb that described how the leaves turn inside out as they tense the approaching rain, torwino, now lost. Wish how well, one word for the sound of the wind and the trees at dusk, lost. Did you know that there's a place in Llandestil that was called a Vairdrevach, a name that tells us of how land was once shared, how the community was once organized, now lost, given way to Happy Donkey Hill. Two different ways of seeing. I hear an NYD Hinav Dawello Hadail, Nese Cloa, by Galo Hidnes Guela Venetir Hun, Etor Hav. So this is how I think materially, through more than one language. And I think that if not, as Robert Frost famously said, that it makes all the difference, then certainly it makes a, diff a big one. A different perspective, a different way of thinking. Llean wen, white, none, as we call this word, is not the same as svu, because it's another point of view. Words, materials, within and without. Yeah. Wonderful, Jelk. Thank you so much. That was um, super uh, thought provoking, and um, yeah, you gave us some really beautiful ideas to to work with. And you know, we um, we selected people not arbitrarily um, to contribute to these sessions. So uh, what you've what you've done in terms of unpacking language was kind of precisely what we we wanted oh, you to do. relief for that case <laughs> i'm in the same boat as me yeah i can assure you <laughs> well actually there's, exploring there's some nice stitching together of your of your presentation so yeah um mm -hmm. it's it's great that that you come after Amelia because i think we can, we can um, pick up on uh on some ideas thank you so much uh, so we um, move swiftly on to, I think, uh, if I revisit my notes, to Joe Ironside uh, from the Institute of Biological, Rural and Environmental Sciences. OK, thank you. So I'm just going to share my screen now. And my presentation, I hope. Yeah. 
Okay, I'm going to uh, to talk about a uh, research project that I've been involved in for the last five years, or that I've actually been leading for the last five years. This is uh, an Ireland Wales interreg project, and um, it's been um, certainly from my perspective very interdisciplinary. Um, I'm a biologist, but the project has also involved it's involved physical oceanographers, it's involved human geographers, it's involved engineers, it's um, involved um, all kinds of of different people bringing their own different um, perspectives. What the project has focused on is the, uh, the, um, this, this uh, phenomenon of, uh, of ocean sprawl, which is uh, a version of, um, of urban sprawl uh, applied to uh, the coasts and the, the offshore area. So uh, we were focusing on the, uh, the intertidal zone, that zone which is of the coastline, which is covered for the tide by part of the day, and, uh, and then uh, exposed to the air for the remains of the day. And also further out that part of the land, which is constantly covered by the sea. And looking at the interaction between, on the one hand, the effects of climate in terms of increased storminess and the rising of sea levels. Um, on the other hand, the reaction of humans to this phenomenon which is in many cases to try and hold back the sea by creating walls and other kinds of uh, defences of the coastline. And then on the third hand, if you have three hands, looking at the, the organisms, the biological communities, the non-human biological communities, which live both in the intertidal zone and, and further out, and how they're affected by this interaction between man and the climate, which results in these, these changes, this urbanization of the shore. So in terms of the, the precise effects that we see, certainly in a place like Wales, well, certainly in Wales and in, and in Ireland, maybe to a slightly lesser extent, but also, also very, very, um, very, very much in part, most of the human infrastructure is on the coast. Wales is hilly in the middle and um, most of the, the, its large towns, most of its railway lines, most of its power stations, most of the infrastructure that humans have built and that humans rely upon is located on the coast. So rising sea levels and increased storminess form a real threat. And um, the natural response of humans is to try and to protect that, that infrastructure and to, uh, to prevent the sea from coming in. And this has some interesting effects upon um, the uh, ecology of the, of the zones which are on the edges of, of the coast here. So one of the first bits of work we did was to do some, um, do some mapping and to actually look at the coasts, to look at which bits were, were still more or less natural, which bits had been, um, had been built upon, and in particular, which, in which bits there were extensive um, sea defences. And, and then to try and predict, looking at, um, at things like the, uh, the risk of sea level rise, the risk of erosion, and the, the kind of infrastructure which was in place on the coast, to try, and, to try and look at which bits were likely to be built on in the near future. And so we came up with a risk map, this heat map here, as you can see for, uh, for Ireland and Wales, as to, to which parts of the coast had already been, been hardened in this way through the creation of defences, and which bits were likely to be hard and hardened in the future. We then thought about uh, we then thought about what the effects of that would be, and and one of the things we did was to compare the biological communities that were living on on artificial shores with with otherwise otherwise similar natural rocky shores. And what what we found is that that artificial structures and this wasn't new; other people had found the same thing. Artificial structures usually provide a very poor habitat for, for native species. So the, uh, if you look on a, on a rocky shore, it's full of, of, of native species forming, forming diverse communities. If you look on an artificial shore, which is usually built either of concrete or of fairly smooth pieces of, of rock, then there's, there's much less living there because most organisms require uh, some kind of surface rugosity. They, they require a complex surface 
in, on which to live. And our engineers tend to produce very smooth surfaces because they're only looking at the actual function of the, the structure in keeping the sea out. However, there's, uh, there's another side to this in that sometimes you end up with situations like the lower picture here. And this is an artificial surface that's been colonized by a huge diversity of organisms. But many of them, but, but most of them, in fact, are non-native. They're, they're organisms which follow humans around and are particularly good, pre-adapted to, to, uh, to colonizing artificial structures that humans build. So while you tend to lose your native species, in some cases, you can, you can build up diverse communities of non-native species on these artificial surfaces. And that in itself can cause problems because they can then spread out and, and take over all kinds of other um, surfaces that we've created. And sometimes having, having these species uh, living on, on our, our, um, our structures can be very detrimental. For example, if you have uh, zebra mussels growing on the, the inside of a pipe, which is cooling a nuclear reactor. Another phenomenon which has resulted from our, our, our building of these structures is coastal squeeze. So very, very simply, if we're looking at the intertidal environment, the intertidal habitats, then normally they're uncovered when the tide goes out, they're covered up when, when um, the tide goes in. And this intertidal zone is very important. It's one of the few, the last few real wildernesses that we have in the UK because it's so difficult for us to actually use this land. Normally, as the sea rises, and this would be happening as the climate changes, the intertidal zone simply moves. So as the sea rises higher, then the tides come in further and the, uh, the intertidal zone moves back and swallows up more of the land. But if we build walls to keep the sea out, then this intertidal zone becomes squeezed. So all of the, all of the life which, which colonizes the intertidal zone is trapped between the wall and the sea, and the area that they have to live in is much smaller. So there are problems in terms of the replacement of natural habitat, the replacement of natural shores with these artificial structures. These, uh, and, um, there's, there's a general um, lessening of the diversity due to the smooth surfaces. There's the, the tendency for non-native species to colonize. And there's also the squeezing of the area, particularly of the intertidal zone, which, which is actually available. So one response to this is to start thinking about the way in which we build these structures. And, uh, and this has led to the concept of eco-engineering. So designing structures with, uh, with, with non-human life in mind, thinking about what we can do to, to make those structures in such a way that they can be colonized by non-human forms of life. This, at this point, I have to stop uh, because um, I'm, I, uh, um, many people immediately think that, that this is a form of greenwashing and it could be used in this way. So if a developer was saying, well, it's okay to destroy this natural ecosystem and replace it with something man-made because I'm, I'm designing it in such a way that it could be uh, colonized by, by other forms of life. Um, this, is, this is not an acceptable argument. However, if you take as your starting point that humans are going to protect certain areas of coastline anyway, whatever happens, because they contain because they contain cities or because they contain other infrastructure that humans are hell-bent on conserving, then on, on preserving, then if it's a choice between um, creating an artificial structure which is inimical to life and creating an artificial structure on which things can grow and can settle and can live, then they, the, uh, the second option is, is, is uh, preferable. So there, are, there have been various attempts to, uh, to create these eco-engineered structures in the past, and we've tested various, various ones in the, uh, on the shores of the Irish Sea. So, so here are just uh, a few examples of the forms these can take. Some of these are quite complex. So you can see here the world harbour tiles are these, these complex concrete uh, tiles which have been developed to, uh, to try and... Um, uh, and provide the right kind of, um, of structures and shapes for, for organisms to grow on. 
you can see just by looking at them that some designs are better than others. So this particular one called the swim through has uh, a lot of seaweed growing on it and, and none of the others do. These are at Milford Haven. Another thing you can do is uh, provide water attaining features. Many intertidal organisms live in rock pools. So just by placing these water retaining features on the surfaces of existing seawalls, you can create these pores of water and uh, allow organisms to live. Again, some of them work better than others. The, uh, the verticals here uh, provide a, a far more complex surface and actually survive better than these uh, pocket tiles. You can see here, this one is empty and that's because it's got a crack in it and all the water runs out at low tide. And this one has fallen off entirely. We have um, surveyed the biodiversity on artificial structures at a lot of different scales. And uh, so we, we've looked at them um, for, uh, for, at a regional scale uh, using satellite mapping. We've used drone Im imaging and laser scanners to look at them at, a, at an intermediate scale. And we've also used close up um, photogrammetry to, uh, to look at them at a very, very close scale at a millimeter scale. And then we've, we've um, also surveyed the biodiversity at all these different scales and tried to look at the association between the, the shapes and aspects and other features of the coasts and the diversity of life that, that actually lives there. We've then tried to, to try and mimic the features which, from, which are best seen best at promoting biodiversity on natural shores by creating artificial shores, artificial structures, which directly mimic those features. So we've, uh, we've, we've done our photogrammetry, we've uh, created 3D models in computers of some of the most biodiverse surfaces that we could find. We've then created concrete versions of those biodiverse surfaces, and we've put them out on other parts of the coast to, to see if, they, uh, if, they, if they're able to, uh, to, if we're able to recreate that uh, biodiversity that the original had. So that's quite a complex way of creating a, um, an artificial structure, an artificial surface, but it is directly modeled on what nature has provided and what nature has shown us can work. There are simpler solutions. As I've mentioned, rock pools are, uh, are very important. And one of the things which makes artificial surfaces less good at supporting life is their lack of water retaining features. So one very simple thing you can do is simply drill holes and drill cord rock balls are, have been shown to be very effective. Either a limpet, there's a little crab in there. And here's some, here's some data, I'm a scientist so I like data. Um, there are um, when we uh, when when we when we drilled these holes, we uh, we compared um, the a drill cord rock ball over a period of several years in terms of the total species richness with uh, an unmodified surface, the one without any holes in, and we saw a definite increase in the species richness of the surfaces with the holes in. And just visually, you can see here. So this is. Um, this is a, an artificial hole, this is a natural hole, and over time, both of them gradually came to support more life, uh, more different kinds of life, but, but the effects were not entirely the same for the, the natural and the artificial hole, and this could be due to, again, the smoothness of the surface, or perhaps just small differences in, in where they were positioned. Okay, the social dimension, we've explored perceived barriers to implementation. Um, in, uh, one of them is cost, obviously, but engineers are also particularly worried that by, by making structures rougher and more complex, we might impair their, their primary function of, of keeping the sea out. So, so we got our own engineers to, uh, to test various materials and, uh, and various type modifications of the shape of these structures. Um, in, 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 various, in various ways, including um, putting them in, in wave pools and, uh, and seeing what effect it has on, it had on the ability of waves to overtop those structures. Okay, um, I'm aware I've gone a bit over time, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up soon, but I just wanted to, uh, to talk to you about um, 
some of the work that we did with people as well. So, so as well as engaging with the engineers to, to see what, um, what their main worries were about things living on, um, on artificial structures, we also engaged with uh, the public and, and various other groups of people to, uh, to see what they, whether they actually appreciated the, uh, the life living on, on coastal structures and whether they felt it did them any good and, and whether they liked it. And because there's now a, there's now a real appreciation that, um, that exposure to, uh, to natural things can, can be good for people's mental state and good for people's health. But most of that work has been done, has been done inland. Very little has been, has been done on the coast. So um, we presented people with various different um, visual scenarios at different scales, containing different numbers of species from a completely bare structure to, to a structure covered in different forms of life and, and saw how they rated it in terms of aesthetic appeal, in terms of, um, of interest and in, in, in terms of the effect they had on them and whether it was calming or not. And generally speaking, people did rate, rate um, structures with a higher species ri richness higher in all of these, in, in all of these, um, these, these, these ways. But a little bit, a little went a long way. They didn't like completely bare structures, but they didn't differentiate that much between structures with only a few species on and structures with loads. But when you actually looked at, at free text comments and the way in which they described different structures using their own words, you got a much more nuanced view of things. And, and people were at some level, level able to perceive that uh, a, a structure with um, with six species growing on it was still better than a structure with four species growing on it. So I'm going to end here because, because I've gone way over my allotted time, but um, I've got some other things I could talk about maybe in the discussion at the end. Thank you, Joe. Uh, again, lots of, uh, lots of things to think about, lots of ideas, um, things that we can pick up on at the, at the end. If you can stop sharing your screen, we... Yeah, I'm trying to. Hang oh, on. Oh, sorry. there it is. There it is. <laughs> That's it. Sorry, I couldn't, couldn't find it. It was hidden behind something. That's okay. Um, so we'll move on um, to Gareth Hoskins from the uh, senior lecturer in the Department of um, Geography and Earth Sciences, who's the, the last person to, to present. And then we can um, bring all of these ideas together. Thanks, Gareth. All right, cool. Thanks, Kim. Can everyone hear me all right? Can you, yeah, is that all right? Right, let me do the screen sharing thing. Um, I th uh, hopefully there won't be too much delay. Share. Yeah, is that all right? Can you see that? Yes. I was kind of caught in a, in a bit of a, in an in-between zone because cause the, the, the length of the talk was eight minutes and I thought like if it was five, I'd probably just wing it and blag it and just kind of talk. But eight changes the whole thing completely. So I put some slides together and it's, it's been really helpful for me to try and articulate, um, I guess, some of my anxieties and issues around like this sort of new materialist paradigm that, that we're all involved in. And particularly that is kind of comes from the title of, of this little talk thing, uh, Material Thinking as Disorientation. So what I, what I mean by that is I want to try and push against a lot of work within kind of post-human philosophy, assemblage theory, the kind of neo-vitalism of Jane Bennett, um, that, that kind of all seems to be looking to the material for orientation, right? For like affinity or to create a connection or a relation, a kind of a sense of immersion, to create an empathy or a sort of shared solidarity with non-human things or non-living things. I guess what I'm more interested in, and I've been inspired by um, the work of Nigel Clark and, and other people, is, is to look less at the similarities and the connections with the material and more the differences. So I guess what I'm interested in is the material as troubling, as, as unsettling, as exposing, as kind of defiantly uncooperative, um, a materialism that kind of rejects our attempts to get close to it. Um, so I kind of that sort of theme has, has come through my work quite a lot. So um, back in, um, I'm a kind of, can, has that slide changed yet on there? Let me see. 
Um, so I'm a kind of cultural geographer, human geographer in background. And I work on um, the politics of memory and commemoration and, and things around preservation. Often the kind of research kind of case studies based over in the US. So I work with California State Parks a lot and a lot in the West. My doctoral research was on Angel Island Immigration Station. And you can see a publication um, up there that relates to that. Um, and the kind of approach I took uh, on, on this was um, to look at a particular way that um, a heritage site was incorporated into the National Landmark program right so angel island immigration station is is a is a facility of a kind of to protect the borders from um chinese laborer immigrants coming in in the 1880s through up until like the 1940s so it was a kind of a um a gate you know um to stop and prevent and police and inspect and detain ultimately chinese um people coming in um, and the kind of the remains of this facility then were were designated eventually in 1997 as a National Historic Landmark, as a National Museum. And so my PhD then was about how this kind of this story of exclusion and racism in American history was plugged into and incorporated into this more kind of positive multicultural national immigration narrative that, you know, we, we're all kind of familiar with, with the Statue of Liberty and stuff. Uh, and the materiality aspect that comes into this, this is why I put the paper up, is, is to kind of flag, I told this story about a monument, right, that had been put up on the site by a Chinese-American kind of businessman in San Francisco um, that had kind of Chinese lettering on, and it was right in the middle of the site that the National Park Service wanted to, turn into this kind of immersive visitor experience, right? Um, that would kind of reenact some of the processes of exclusion and things. And this monument and its kind of materiality was a complete like pain in the ass really for the for the National Park Service. They wanted to do this, you know, um, multicultural kind of uh, embodied experience. And then there was this big granite obelisk in the middle that was kind of linked to a previous mode of commemoration. And so the kind of the materiality of it, the position of it caused problems for the park service. And they ended up having to move it out of the way so they could invest all this money to create this much more sensitive um, landmark. So I've been kind of talking about that, the materiality and the object centeredness of heritage for quite a while. Um, some other stuff I've been doing is uh, linked to a, a project that I, I got funded by the AHRC to look at um, mining memories and industrial history and to, to kind of look at different sort of emblematic high-profile industrial heritage sites around the world, um, some in South Wales. Um, this one example up here is in California uh, and another example in South Africa. And what I was trying to do there was, was work with uh, I guess, communities and interpretive staff and kind of cultural resource managers to, to try and kind of critique sort of the conquest of nature narratives that had been like encoded into these industrial heritage sites. So there's a lot of celebration of kind of technological mastery. Um, so you can see a little bit here um, on, on the slide in, in the top, uh, in the top corner, this kind of historic photo by a guy called Carlton Watkins, who, who took a series of images of hydraulic mining. So this is kind of really impressive, large scale pressure washing of hillsides for, for gold that creates this huge chasm uh, in the landscape. And that kind of chasm then gets commemorated and designated. You can see this black and white photo of all these people. This is the opening of the park in the 1960s, where they're kind of celebrating, you know, uh, technological conquest and prowess and, you know, all the kind of struggle and the solidarity and the persistence that uh, created this town called Malakoff Diggins. Um, so I was looking in the kind of materialist sense there of how, uh, how the kind of different bits of kind of waste and ruin and toxicity pushed against all the kind of interpretive efforts of the park to try and teach us something, to try and teach us about social advance and technological progress, 
or also to teach us about environmental ruin. So I was looking at the kind of the agencies of what was left there at the site and, and how they kind of disturbed and complicated things. So, so for some people, they wanted to look at Malakoff diggings today as this kind of desolate place of environmental ruin. But because the kind of the practice of hydraulic mining was kind of banned and diminished up until about the 1920s, everything had kind of grew, grown back and it looked, you know, it was really aesthetic, really impressive. It looked like a kind of a wilderness. So there's this kind of power of, you know, vegetative agency to try and dent the, the kind of environmental kind of force of the message there. Um, but there was also kind of, um, just kind of ruin and wear and tear of objects and things that, that kind of dented the sort of social achievement and uh, mastery over nature kind of uh, idea as well. What you can see up there on the slides is, is, is one of the ways I tried to dent some of the heroic narratives there with, with looking at kind of correspondence from people who, who lived at this kind of now abandoned town or this kind of tourist town it is now really, but people who lived there at the time. And I was trying to tell more, much more kind of mundane everyday stories of, of living in this kind of big moment of environmental transformation in the 1880s and 1890s. And just to try and, I guess, talk about the kind of everyday lives and mundane histories of things. So this is stuff about, uh, you know, stock routines and requests around like managing infrastructure and irrigation, things like kind of correspondence courses that, um, that kind of women in the town did around kind of watercolour painting, learning to play musical instruments and things. So that was a way to deflect some of the kind of heroic stories of either like industrial devastation or, uh, you know, technological progress and things. Um, so uh, a kind of the other sort of case study on that was, was about um, the big hole in Kimberley in South Africa, which is like up until recently anyway, was designated as the largest hand dug diamond mine operated by De Beers. Um, so what I was looking at there was kind of from the De Beers archive, looking at records of industrial accidents and, and thinking about how the kind of histories of race and violence and colonialism get obscured by the kind of more contemporary packaging of this place as a tourist destination. Um, so from those kind of case studies, uh, myself and Mark Whitehead uh, in the geography department kind of co-wrote this, um, this book, uh, Place in the Anthropocene, which was a bit of a kind of a critical walking tour of all these different sites um, to try and get them sort of recognise less, um, less as kind of icons of industrial development and more as sort of landmarks of the Anthropocene. So part of like the birth and the global extension of industrial capitalism. Um, so if you think, you know, the Anthropocene is as something as a kind of a modern era, we were trying to get, get the kind of these places kind of plugged into that as kind of early moments of the Anthropocene. Um, I've done some other stuff as well uh, on value and, and materiality comes into that quite well. So, so what I was looking at here, it was um, different kind of logics of designation uh, and the way historical value gets counted in different sort of listing systems uh, in the US and the UK. Um, and the materiality kind of comes through this, through stuff around atmosphere and effects. Uh, there's lots of debates in geography around atmosphere and affect at the moment. Um, and what I was trying to do and trying to get at was look at the way planners in Washington, D.C. sort of registered the kind of palpable sort of historic weight of a place right, um, or of a building. It's kind of atmosphere, the kind of ineffable, ineffable inexpressible, evanescent properties that are picked up in like old places. And we're trying to figure out how to code those kind of experiences into a kind of a system of counting and calculation that you could use to compare one historic site with another when you have to make decisions about what gets listed. So the kind of the materiality came in, in there through a kind of indirect experience. And most recently, I've been using kind of material thinking 
uh, in the kind of within the field of geo humanities, looking at cultures of weather and also meteorite impacts and craters. Um, so I've done some stuff recently on uh, near Earth objects and the kind of regulation of and guarding and surveillance of meteorites. And but I suppose that what I'm sort of interested in in relation to this is how that kind of the risk of like catastrophic impact right from um, a meteorite or a comet or whatever kind of helps us it kind of shows us that the the materiality of the cosmos is entirely uncooperative basically and it gets us to kind of appreciate and realize kind of our position on that in a kind of in a sort of current kind of immediate politics of environmental change when you think about kind of potential impacts from meteorites and comets, then you, you get a kind of a longer kind of different perspective around environmental change and evolution and the fact that, you know, we're a kind of a lucky temporary kind of outcome on this planet that is kind of massively indifferent to our presence. Um, so there's the meteorite and impact stuff. And then it more, more recently and a little bit more involved, I've been doing stuff on cultures of weather and looking in particular at the Santa Ana wind, um, which is this kind of wind that comes off the Mojave Desert in California um, and is kind of uh, known since the 1880s uh, as kind of like embedded in the landscape as having this kind of mood altering kind of malevolent effect on the population and the kind of the suburbs of greater Los Angeles. Um, it gets kind of plugged into local news stories and then kind of written up uh, in um, in kind of romance and crime fiction. But one of the kind of the, the most famous kind of records and renderings of the Santorana wind uh, comes from um, Joan Didion, right? In this essay in 1960s um, called Some Dreamers of the Golden Dream. And she what she does in this is kind of echo a lot of other work that has been done um, on the wind as this kind of gothic force, all right, that, that kind of haunts the population of, uh, of Los Angeles, um, that kind of puts us on edge. And she writes about it in a really kind of wonderful, poetic, compelling way. Um, she talks about the weather of kind of prickly dread that puts you on edge. Um, and lots of us can maybe kind of relate to that. Um, that kind of emotional response to the weather and wind. And there's, there's a huge amount of literature on weather and health, um, the idea of kind of meteoropathy. Um, and that goes back right, right back to kind of ancient, ancient Greece and, and probably before that. But in this context, and this is some, something I'm really trying to navigate, and I'm just coming up to the end here. So in, in California, writing about the Santa Ana wind, um, we're in a kind of set, settler colonial context, all right? Uh, and writing about the weather in this way creates what indigenous feminist anthropologist Zoe Todd calls air noleus, which is kind of a kind of creation of an atmosphere as a blank canvas, right? Or as a blank commons that bypasses or sidelines previous kind of indigenous presence. So some, a lot of the stuff that I'm finding a lot of people who are writing about the Santa Ana wind, maybe they're like self-published people, but they tend to be kind of white, kind of boomer age generations writing about their kind of pioneering experiences and being moved by the wind. And, and I, I, I'm getting the sense that this is like a really convenient way to kind of sidestep or ignore or erase like the presence of um, indigenous people, previous indigenous people. And I, I, I can see myself getting caught up in it sometimes, um, and I've been guilty of it in the past, but there's a sense that like when we think ourselves into the land or create kind of imagined intimacies with, with the air, with the wind, with the soil, with outer space and stuff, we're also kind of in danger of perpetuating an erasure, all right? Um, so, so for like Joan Didion, who is, you know, a kind of a massive real estate landowner in Sacramento was linked to kind of a white pioneer in nobility. Um, you know, she doesn't talk at all about kind of um, 
slavery or about Asian American history or about indigenous history at all. She gets us straight into the wind, you know, and thinking about how we can be connected to the landscape. And that's seductive and compelling, but it just erases indigenous presence. I think we probably um, need to wrap up the Gareth. Yeah, we? okay. That's it. That's that's it. Done done yeah. anyway. Sorry to put you up, but we yeah, we've only we've got a really short amount of time for questions and discussion now. So um, yeah, thank you so much again. Uh, lots of of ideas.